Okay. Good evening, everybody. So the, we'll start. We'll start. I'm sorry for, to make it confusing, and my apologies to the people that are joining us remotely. As I told the people that are with us, I had to go to the, uh, Renana today to escort my wife to buy a car, and it, uh, I'm a bit unorganized. Okay. Anyway, so there are actually two Marmokoyim sheets. One is very thick. One is very big. Thank you, David, for taking care of that. And the other one is something that I put together some important marmokayimis. I'll try to fill those in, okay? So tonight, the controversy is actually about a controversy that's taking place currently in Eretz Yisrael, in Israel, the Geirus controversy. What are the standards, what are the minimum standards for conversion? Now, in Israel, there is no separation of church and state, or there's no full separation of church and state. One of the reasons is because there's a law of return. If somebody's Jewish... According to Israeli law, he has a right to come in and be allowed entry and to get residency here and live here. So therefore, the government needs to define what's Jewish. Okay, once you have to define what's Jewish, then you have to get into the halachic realm. Okay? So the status quo in Eretz Yisrael has always been to accept the orthodox view of who is Jewish and who is not as Jewish, the halachic view of who is Jewish and who is not as Jewish. Well, for the law of the turn, there's also a law that if you have one grandparent... Right. But if somebody, for example, had gone through a conversion, so is he Jewish or not? So until now, the government has recognized that a conversion is only valid if it's been through an orthodox conversion. Now, for the government, it's a bit of a headache. Um, the, the reform and conservative movements are lobbying the government strongly that they should have their conversions recognized as well, the reform conversions and the conservative conversions. Um, Obviously, the religious parties in the Israeli Knesset are very opposed to that. Um, but even within Orthodox controversy, even within Orthodox conversion, there's still quite a bit of a controversy because there is there are certain rabbis with even within the realm of Orthodoxy that want to promote the idea that you don't need Kabbalahs al mitzvahs in order to become a convert; that you don't have to accept the yoke. You don't have to agree or to commit to live a halachic lifestyle in order to become halachically Jewish. Even if you don't commit to observe halacha, you can still become Jewish. Okay? Now, for many decades, this was considered a fringe opinion, if at all. If anything, maybe it wasn't even considered a valid opinion uh, at all. But in recent years, even within Orthodox circles, this opinion has started to gain some traction. Um, I didn't bring it with me. I have it in my knapsack. For example, in the Besheva. In the, I don't know if you read the Besheva. The free newspaper that comes on Thursday is a good newspaper. It's a Datsilini newspaper. So they have a section every week written up from Rabbi Eliezer Malamed. Rabbi Eliezer Malamed is an author of many books, Pini Halach, I think it's called. And he wrote up a long argument, actually arguing in favor of this view, right? saying that you can accept converts even if they don't commit to live a halachic lifestyle. The next week, um, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu from Svat wrote to the Besheva, wrote a long article arguing against the opinion of Rabbi Malabin. He says that there is no such valid opinion. Kabbalah's all mitzvahs accepting halacha is the basis of, uh, of Geirus, is the, ba- is the most basic requirement in order to accept the validity of a conversion. If somebody doesn't accept or commit to live according to the halacha, he's not a gear altogether. And, uh, but nevertheless, the next week, Rabbi Lezer Malamit continue to write in defense of his stance, okay? So the question is, is tonight, let's look, at, uh, let's look at this issue. So just to give a little bit of a background of what goes on in, in the reference sheet, okay? I'm going to refer to this as the supplement reference sheet, and I'm going to refer to this as the reference sheet. I'm sorry about the confusion. So number one in the reference sheet, this is, I just gave an example. This is from the Piskei Din Rabbanim, okay, if you look at the Bar Ilan Shit Project, they have a whole collection of rabbinic psachim and the Beit Din and the Rabbanut, cases that came before the, the Beit Din, the Bate Dinim and the Rabbanut, and obviously they have to write, after the psak is given, they write out each of the Dayan and write up their position. And it's, this is, I brought an example of um, the psak Din Kuflamid, um, this is basically a case that came in front of Rav Shlomo Tichovsky and also of Ezra Bar Shalom, Rav Avram Sherman, three Dayanim, and they had a big debate. What was the case? Um, let's just read the paragraph, the first paragraph. 
there was one of the local Batei Dinim ruled as follows. Let's read what it says. La'ar hanal einan yuchalim nas is het in yisu en amavakesh beglal haspakat hasfekot sheish lo bi yehuda yishal amavakesh. There was a certain fellow who wanted to marry a woman and the Beit Din turned him down because he said he's not Jewish. The Beit Din didn't accept that this fellow was Jewish. So this person came to the Beit Din Hagadol, the highest, the supreme rabbinic court in Yerushalayim to object. It was his mother Geirus, okay. Very good, also his mother, the head of the two year, he wasn't able to produce the necessary documentation. Um, so I just wanted to, this was in 2007, it was a very controversial virtual case, and the Dayanam write that this thing, that this controversy went back and forth for a very long time. So if you read the last section, this is something the Rabbi Avram Sherman. Avram Sherman wanted to uphold the Pesach of the local Beisdin, and he described Magama, a certain pattern, a certain phenomenon that's going on in Israel, where there are certain bodies that want to accept the notion that you can have geirus, that you can have conversion without having to him into Allah. And it was just, I just want to read and translate some of these that he said. There's a certain movement to annul the need to accept mitzvahs as the most basic, fundamental component of gear, of conversion. These bodies want to just make a conversion It's something social, just as a social status, but not as a religious identity. Okay, conversion, they want conversion to be something that's disconnected from religion. Okay, so that's where Sherman wanted to uphold the Pesach of the local Beit Din. In fact, he, he was on the losing side because the majority of the Dayanim actually accepted the objection of this person. Okay, so I just, just a bit of a background to say this is some of the sentiment in today's, and currently in the, in the rabbinate, the consensus there is that uh, we have to fight this. We have to oppose the movement that's trying to make gear something social as opposed to something religious. Okay? Now, one of the things that the, 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 uh, the minister of religion is... Um, Kahana. Kahana, yeah. The name slipped me. Matan Kahana. Okay? So I think if I understood correctly, and somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, I understand what Matan Kahana is doing. He's trying to say, he's trying to rem remove the monopoly that the Beidin, that the rabbinate, the Rabbanut, the yeah. government recognized has each on gear, and each Rav could independently determine whether or not he wants to be right. Magari the person. Now that means that certain bodies, for example, I know that Sohar has a lot of elements that are in favor of this and others. I'm not sure if maybe um, Rabbi Riskin from Afrat, if, if he also, um, I, I, I think that he also supports that definition of Geras, I have to look into that, I don't want to be quoted, and if I'm making that, I, but there are many rabbinic bodies that are okay with converting uh, Goyim, converting Gentiles, making them Jewish without them commit to living according to halacha. And the concern of the rabbinate is, is that now you'll have Goyim that never committed to halachic lifestyle. That's basically the concern. Does that mean that they don't have any halachic connection? Or that they're the basic, you know, they're... Right, so what is the basics? You get into very great areas. For example, Rabbi Lezer Malamud said it's good enough for them to commit to live as a Masorti. What is a Masorti? A Masorti is very vague. It's not equivocal. It's, it's, what is a Masorti? You like, uh, you like a menorah? What if you light menorah with a Christmas tree? Is there, is there allowed to be a Christmas tree together with the, with the lighting of the menorah? If you eat matzah and pesach, what if you eat matzah and pesach, but you eat chametz and chalamah? It becomes very hard to define. Okay, so that's one of the things that we're going to try to do, is to try to identify and exactly figure out what does the Allah require in order for somebody to be suitable for Gabriel, for conversion. Okay, so first of all, number one, on the, well, it's actually the second number one. Okay, I brought the Pesukim on Megillah Drus. Megillah Drus is the section that deals with Gerud, the dealing with Rut. The time he is trying to convince trying to convince Rut to go back to her, her royal family in Moab. The term Rut al Evi, don't offend me, la Ozveich, la Shuv, ma Acharaich, ki la Shetati Eilech. Wherever you go, I will go. Vashatulin Elden, wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Amech Ami, your nation, Amech Ami, 
Your nation is my nation. Your God is my God. Okay? Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. Only death will do us apart. Okay? So, according to the Gemara, this isn't just a dramatic or a poetic or an expression of, of emotion. It's actually uh, the way the Chacham interpreted it, it's a very technical halachic requirement for Geirus. So, number one, she said, Amech Ami. Your nation is my nation. And what else did she say? Your God is my God. Okay? So the Gemara Nivam Mustaf Mamzayim understands that this is the basis for becoming a Ger, the basis for becoming Jewish. The Gemara Nivam Mustaf Mamzayim Amad Beis. Okay? So it says, Amrullah, what did Naomi say to Ruth? Asulon Chum Shabbos. Don't continue to walk because you're not allowed to walk past the boundary of Shabbos. Right? The Chacham made a 2,000 amma boundary around the city up until uh, which a person may walk. She says, I'll go where you go. Which means to say, I accept upon myself to accept the halachic uh, restriction of walking past the Tchum Shabbos. You're not allowed to do yichud. You're not allowed to be in seclusion with a man to whom you're not allowed to have relations with. I'm going to lodge where you lodge. This is a very key point. She says, well, we're commanded to observe 613 commands. So what did she say? Amech ami. My nation is your nation. So this is a key point. Um, she was saying, amech ami. My nation is your nation. The Gemara understands that to mean that she was accepting upon herself to observe the 613 mitzvahs. Okay? So which means to say, if it weren't for the Gemara in Yavam I would say, amech ami means to say, identify as a Jew. Or my identify as a citizen of Israel. I don't know how you would define it, but it's something to do with na- a nationalistic identity. But no, Amech Ami, my nation is your nation, meaning to say I'm going to observe all 613 mitzvahs. I believe that this is the source for what Rabbi Nusad Yogayim said in Amunas Fahadei, in Mamre Gimel, number three, on your reference sheet. Umatenu einena uma, our nation is not a nation, ki'im unless comes along with its laws, with its instructions, with the Torah. So Rabbeinu Sadi Goyen is not saying something only, uh, is only, is not only making a philosophical statement, he's making a very profound statement as to how you define what the Jewish nation is. Okay, so let me repeat that according to Marosh Shiva or Rav Oiz, this is a very fundamental statement. Umateinu einenu umakim The nationhood of Israel is identified by the laws and instructives that it uh, abides by, okay? So the Gemara continues in Yuvah Mestaf Mem Zayin, right? Again, the Gemara Mem Zayin Amad Aleph. Just look at the bold section. Umadin Oisem Mixas Mrs. Kalos and Mixas Mrs. Chamurais, when a guy would like to become Jewish. So the Gemara in Yuvah says that we need to, inf- we need to inform him uh, about some of the more lenient commandments and some of the more Strange and more severe commandments. Okay, so you don't have to inform them of all 630 mitzvahs. It's enough to inform them of some of the mitzvahs. So the question is, how does that work? Right? In other words, if he has to accept all 613 mitzvahs, why is it enough just to inform him of some of the mitzvahs? Okay, so the answer isn't that complicated, but let's move on anyways. So the Gemara says, number five on the reference sheet, the Gemara describes after the Ger accepts upon himself to be Jewish. So he has to go through circumcision. Right? There are some strips of skin that disqualify the circumcision. Then we have to cut off those strips of skin. And the strap, but once he heals Makbil and Aysam Yad, then you can immediately immerse them in a mikvah. The Shnei Tamilcham Oid Magama, there has to be two Tamilcham that witness him immerse himself in a mikvah. Or Madina is a mitzvah, Mrs. Kalos, and Mrs. Kamura is to inform him some of the more severe mitzvahs, some of the less severe mitzvahs. Tavo Allah, once he comes out of the mikvah, Harev Kisar Khadari is considered a fully fledged Jew. Right? Now, Isha, what about a woman? Right? It would be completely um, unacceptable for Dayanim, for male Dayanim, to witness her go into the mikvah. So, Nashim HaShigah says, there's a woman that takes her in the mikvah, or witnesses, or is, accompanies okay. her to the mikvah, to her neck. The two mikvah have to stand outside the room of the mikvah. 
Um, when they're standing outside the mikvah through the window, or they shout over the, through the door, they're outside, they can't see her, but through the door they tell her what mitzvah she needs to observe. They say, okay, you'll have to keep kosher, there's certain foods you will be allowed to eat, there's certain foods you won't be allowed to eat, you'll have to observe the Shabbos, the basic uh, mitzvahs, they don't inform her of everything. Echad, gerv, echad, There's another way for a non-Jew to become Jewish, if he was a slave or a maidservant, he was under Jewish ownership. Once he's free, he also becomes Jewish. It's the same story. That person who was formerly a, a slave has to go to the mikvah, and they ha- he has to be informed of the mitzvahs. Okay? So the question is, Rashi already deals with this question, why is it that at the time of the immersion, they have to be informed of the mitzvahs? Says the Rashi. He's going to complete his conversion process by going into the mikvah. therefore, at the time of the immersion, mitzvah alav o mitzvahs. He has to accept upon himself the yoke of mitzvahs. Rashi actually learned it from the continuation of the Gemara in Yavamas number 7, where the Gemara in Yavamas says, Echad gerv, echad meshukhra, kasal kataitich, la kabol alav o mitzvahs. The habamin of the Gemara is that there's no difference between a non-Jew that's becoming Jewish and a slave that's becoming Jewish, the Gemara thought the same with regards to accepting upon themselves all mitzvahs. So once you see over here that the Gemara, when the Kibbal Allah, when the Gemara says at the time of the immersion, Kibbal he has to accept upon himself, it's very clear that the Gemara is referring to Kabbalah al mitzvah, to accept upon himself the yoke of the mitzvah, stated explicitly in the Gemara in Yavam Mazdat Mem Zayin. The Gemara's maskani is that a slave that's freed at the time that he's being freed, he doesn't need to accept upon himself the mitzvahs. He doesn't need to, according to many Rishayinim, at the time that he becomes a slave or that he enters Jewish ownership, at that point he needs to, he needs to accept upon himself the mitzvahs. But at the time that the, I don't want to use the word slave, I would say servant, okay? But the point is that he has some sort of element of Jewish ownership. Uh, so since at the time that he went into Jewish ownership, he accepted upon himself the mitzvahs, at the time that he's freed, he does not need to accept upon himself the mitzvahs. So the Gemara says, so what is the common denominator between a non-Jew that's becoming Jewish and a slave that's becoming Jewish? The Gemara says, the Indian tefillah. They both need to enter into the mikvah. But in any case, the Gemara is very clear that when a non-Jew becomes a Jew, the Gemara says explicitly, lekabel alav o mitzvahs. Those are the words of the Gemara Yavamis. He has to accept upon himself the o mitzvahs. Okay? I just brought the entire quote from Rav Sadi Goyen. It's an important quote. Number nine, our nation is only defined by the Torah that we accord to. Since the Creator said that this nation will continue to exist for eternity, just as the heavens and the earth continue to exist for eternity, so the Torah has to continue to exist. In other words, since the nationhood and the Torah are interlocked, their definition is intertwined, so if the Jewish people need to survive forever, so does the Torah need to survive forever. Because if there's no Torah, there's no nation. Okay, that's the idea that Rabbi Sadi Gohan says. Uh, the Tzitz Eliezer, number 11, in the reference sheet, the Tzitz Eliezer already takes note of the fundamental importance of this statement of Rabbeinu Sadi Goyin, and he says that this Hagdara, the last line in the Tzitzit, has Hagdara Muftit Zot, this um, fundamental definition of Rabbeinu Sadi Goyin, Noset B'chovah Sod Kol Torah Kimu Matenu, it's the Sod, it's the foundation, it's the definition of our entire nation, okay? The Idach Prushu Zil Gomer, everything else is just like a Commentary on this fundamental statement of Rabbeinu Sadi Yugoyen that our nations are defined by the Torah that we live by. Okay? So that's uh, important stuff. Um, number 12 in the reference sheet, the Shach in Yorde and Simen Reish Shamaches, Tet. Kabbalat HaMitzvot says the Shach in Loi Gimel. If one did not accept the Mitzvot in front of three judges, I feel the Evid Ma'akir. So then there's no Geirut whatsoever. Just as the Tosfot and the Rosh 
stated explicitly that if there's no exception to the mitzvahs in front of three dayanim, then the geiris is completely invalid. Right? What Tosfot and what Rashi is referring to? Tosfot and Sechaz Yom, Mestaf Mem Hey, deals with a, an interesting question. When a woman goes into the mikvah, correct? Who's witnessing her going into the mikvah? Not the male dayanim. She's accompanied with a Jew, by a Jewish woman. The dayanim stand outside. So how does that work? Right? Doesn't it have to be done in front of three? So says Tosfot and Yavam Mem Hey, I put the section of bold. The only time that you need three dayanim, Hainu La Kabbalat HaMitzvot, that's only for the accepting of the mitzvah, but not for the tefillah. So therefore, it's good enough that the dayanim stand outside when she immerses herself in the mikvah. Number 14, the Rosh also repeats that concept of Tosvot, and the Ramban says it as well. So Rav Yashaber Salavejik, I didn't bring it in the reference sheet, I didn't have his sefer available to quote, but in his chidushin, his shiurim on uh, Yavam Esmen Hay, he says, what's, he asks the question, what's the difference? How come Kabbalah's al mitzvahs, when she accepts upon herself the mitzvahs, it has to be done in front of three judges? Why is that? How come the, the, the tefillah, the immersion, doesn't need to be done in front of three judges? What is the difference? Sorry? Oh, so that's a discussion in the Gemara. If the tefillah is ma'akiv, it's machoikis in the Yerushalmi Kedushin. If the tefillah is ma'akiv, we pass on that tefillah is ma'akiv. So, Rav Yashaber Salavechik, now I ask you to please turn to your supplement reference. My apologies to those that are joining us remotely. This is from the Shudzecha Yitzchak of Itzel Aponovitcher. Okay. He's actually quoting this from a shuvah of Zalman Sender. Zalman Sender Shapiro. Okay. I'm not sure if that's what it is. It's a Ram Shapiro. I'm not sure. Okay, maybe it's a father. I have no idea. I didn't look into it. So he says an important concept. I heard this concept also from a Rosh Hashiva of Ari of Oza, and he considers this a very, considers this a very fundamental concept in the idea that relates to the idea of geir of conversion. Ma shabir, right? Dvar hakoyim and bi'ini muberet shen geira al pi shechidish, right? Zalman Sender was machadish shemila v'tfila. Circumcision and immersion in a mikvah enemy payle hagiros. That's not the essential conversion. Rak hamila, the circumcision letar mitumas argos. That is to purify the Gentile from the impurity of being uncircumcised. Vahatsvila, the immersion in the mikvah letar mitumas akol. That comes to that comes to purify the non-Jew from the impurity of being a Gentile. He cannot enter Geirut, he cannot enter conversion if he still carries some of the impurities of being a non-Jew. What is the essential Geirut? What is the essential conversion? The acceptance of mitzvahs, that is the essential conversion. In other words, the circumcision and the immersion are only means to enable the conversion. But the essential conversion, the act of conversion, the act of becoming a Jew, is the acceptance to commit to the Torah. Because as we saw in Rabbi Sadiq, that our nation is defined by abidance to the 613 mitzvahs. Okay? So Rav Yashaber Salavechik repeats this concept. He does, I, don't know if he, I don't remember him quoting the Zecher Yitzchak, but he says the concept himself. He says, that explains why, when it comes to the Mila and the Tefillah, you don't need to have three people there with the Evid. Why not? Because that's not the essential Geirus. Masha Enkin, when you accept the mitzvahs, the Gemara in Yovamus learns it from the Pasuk of Zois HaMishpat. In other words, the Gemara learns that the essential Geirus needs to be done in front of three people. So therefore, when the person accepts the mitzvahs, which is the essential Geirus, it needs to be done in front of three. But the tefillah and the mila, which are only means to enable the geiros, doesn't need to be in front of three b'diyavid. That's how Rabbi Yashar Bar Salavechik explains it. That's also the way Rav Shmuel Rizovsky explains it. Okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. I'll raise your question. Basically, what you're asking is, what about Matan Torah? Right? What did we do about Matan Torah? You're absolutely correct. The Gemara increases that test explicitly. How do we know that a Ger, that somebody that converts to Judaism, needs to have a Brismila? The Gemara says, because we had Brismila 
before Har Sinai. How do we know that he needs to immerse in a mikvah? Because we immersed in the mikvah at Har Sinai. How do we know that he needs to bring a carbon? Today, when I, if a, a dentist is not able to bring a carbon, so it's not active. But when the base of Mikdash is standing, if somebody became Jewish, he would need to bring a carbon. How do we know you need to bring a carbon? Because we brought carbonus at Sinai. So you see that we, under, we, we went through the conversion at Sinai. And whatever we did at Sinai is the basis for what a Gentile needs to do if he wants to become Jewish after the giving of the Torah at Sinai. What was the most fundamental aspect of Sinai? Nasa v'nishma, the acceptance of mitzvahs. Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Atem tu mamlachas kan v'goy kadosh. Ask them if they want to accept upon themselves the mitzvahs. The people said Nasa v'nishma. That was the defining act of conversion at Sinai. Now, if a non-Jew says, I'm going to become Jewish, I'll go through the milah, I'll do circumcision, I'll immerse myself in a mikvah. I'm not going to commit the halacha. That would be like Har Sinai without the Nasa Vinishma. That would be like Har Sinai with going to the mikvah, bringing karbanas, having circumcision, but not having any milah. Would there be a giving of the Torah at Sinai if there was no acceptance of the halacha, no acceptance of the Torah? Obviously not. When a ger, when a Gentile accepts halacha, what he's doing is he's going through the same motions of Nasev and Ishma that we went through when we stood at Sinai. Oh, so I'm going to ask you exactly what, did, what did these plays can mean, okay? So, the, just to elaborate, continuing on this post, I'm going to stick on the supplement um, uh, reference sheet. My apologies to those who don't have it, those that are with us remotely. The Gemara in Kesuvah Stafir Aleph, the, the, the Gemara there says that if a family would like to become Jewish and there are young children that are not of the age of Bar Mitzvah, so if there's a father there, the father could make them Jewish and only when the child becomes of the age of Bar Mitzvah could he retroactively revoke his Geirus. But if he doesn't revoke the Geirus, then the child can, carries on to be Jewish. But happens if there is no father, the Gemara says that the Beisin could do it on their behalf. The Gemara says, how could the Beisin make the fellow Jewish without consult? He's still a child. He can't give his consent. The Gemara says, Zachon la'adam shalei b'fani. You're allowed to do something advantageous for a person without his consent. The Gemara says, Who's, who says it's advantageous? Maybe he prefers to be a Gentile. The Gemara says, when does a person prefer to get a Gentile? When he gets used to the Gentile life. If somebody's used to living as a Gentile, he enjoys his ham, he enjoys living as a Gentile. He may not see it as being advantageous to become Jewish, but if a child is trained to live a Jewish life, then for him it certainly is advantageous, unless when he gets to the age of maturity, he says, I don't want to be Jewish, then he retroactively revokes the Geirus. So the Gemara there in the second paragraph, if you have a family that would like to become Jewish, the Bedin could immerse the child in a mikvah and on the child's behalf make him Jewish. Second paragraph, let's bring a proof to the concept of Avhuna. Okay? We can go through the proof. It's not essential, but we want to talk about it. So asks the Ritz from the Shittim Ukubet, it's number four on the reference sheet. He says, I don't understand. We should bring a better proof. The Jewish people, when did they go through their conversion? At Sinai. There were many children at Sinai. Did, were those children that were yet to have reached the age of maturity, did they, were they able to give their consent? No, but we made them Jewish anyways. So that should have been approved for Avuna. That's the Rifka's question. Do you follow the question? Again, I believe he's basing himself on the Gemara and Krisis Daf test that says that Sinai was an act of conversion. It's an excellent question. Let me just repeat the question, if I may. It says, we, the Gemara is attempting to find a support and a basis for Avuna that said that the Basin can convert children. That says the support, the source should be Sinai, when many children became Jewish at Sinai. So says the Ritz when the second answer, I put it in bold, Mercy, you can't prove it from there. So where it says, the Ains El Gmar Geris. Sinai was just the completion of the Geris process. What does he mean? Completion of he says, when we stood at Sinai, we had Geirus. We had a conversion, but it was only the completion of the Geirus process. It's very vague. What does he mean? So comes the Granat, Rabbi Naftali Trach, that's my Rosh Hashiva also, if I remember correctly, quoted this from the Dvar of Raham, it's also based on the Zeri Yitzchak. And they say a very fundamental concept about Geirus, a very, very fundamental concept about conversion. 
First of all, Rabbi Fali Trapp, who is the Rosh Hashiv and Radin under the Chafetz Chaim, he has a few famous chidushim. This is perhaps the most famous you saw that Rabbi Fali Trapp was Machadej. It's based on the Ramban in uh, Vayikra Perak Chavdal. It's based on the Pasuk in Vayikra, and Parashas Emmer, Vayikra, Ben Ish Yisraelis, Ben Ish Nitzvah. We talk about a fight between the Jewish man and the man that was born from an Egyptian father and a Jewish mother. Okay, so they had a fight, Rashi, they're being from Chazal, they had a fight about territory. What happened? The man that had an Egyptian father cursed, and then they put him to death. Okay, so says the Ramban, he quotes the Taras Kahanim, that says, Melami Chinese guy, or he became Jewish. Okay, so asks the Rishonim, why did he need to become Jewish? He had a Jewish mother. Shulam is bas divrit with his mother. Why did he need to go through conversion? So says the Ramban, it doesn't mean very good, it doesn't mean literal conversion. It just meant to say that he decided to follow his mother and not follow his father. He had the choice to either go with his mother into the new bar or he could have stayed in Egypt with his father. He chose to go along with his mother and that is what the Taras Kahanim defines as Giyur. Says the Ramban, second page, the middle section there in bold, He quotes the Tsarfatim, the French scholars. Who's that? Quoted in the Daskainim and the Chizkuni. They say that before Matan Torah, the Jewish identity went after the father. Says the Ramban, I don't agree with it. It's completely wrong. Says the Ramban, a very key statement. He me'ed Shabbat Avram b'rit ha'yisrael. Avram Avinu entered a brit. He entered a covenant with God. So Avram Avinu is the first Jew. So already from the time of Avram Avinu, we were a nation. Let me read that again, the section of old from the Ramban. We were a distinct nation from the moment that Avraham Avinu entered into a covenant with God. Which means that even Esau would have been a Jew had he not gone, had he not decided to throw off the yoke of uh, observance. Okay? So says of Tali Trab, a very uh, important concept based on the Ramban. There are two aspects to conversion. The first thing is called Mishpachat. I didn't have Rabbi Tali Trab's Chidushim with me, so I bought it from the Chidushim of Rabbi Shmuel, Rabbi Shmuel Razovsky, number seven in the reference sheet of the supplement sheet. I'm sorry for those who don't have it. He says there are two things that happen when somebody converts, or more so there are two things that define the Jew. One is what he calls Mishpachat Yisrael, the family. The Jewish people are an extension of one big family. And the other aspect is the Kedushas Yisrael, the sanctity of the Jewish people. So he says, before Matan Torah, from the time that Avraham Avinu entered into a covenant with God until Matan Torah, we were Mishpachas Yisrael. We were the family of the Jewish people. We had nationhood. But only one element of the nationhood, the Mishpachat Yisrael, being the family of the Jewish people. He says, at Sinai, what happened? We completed the second element of being Jewish, the Kedushas Yisrael, the sanctity of the Jewish people. And that is what the Ritva meant. The Ritva meant that at Sinai there was a Gemar gear, there was a completion of the gear, there was a completion of the conversion process, meaning to say we already had the Mishpachat Yisrael, we already had the Family, we were already a family, we were already a distinct nation, right? We were connected, uh, our genes were connected, we, 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 we had something genetic, we, were, uh, we had a distinct genetic identity because we were part of one big family. The completion of sign is where we received the sanctity of the Jewish people. And so about a get both. Sorry? So a ger, the chidosh is that it gets both. And you do that, it's not, uh, it's not very... So that's what the Gemara says. The Geirim, the Mishnah, based on the Mishnah of Bikurim, the Geirim are all considered descendants of Avraham Avinu. Why did he say the Geirim are descendants of Avraham Avinu? How can a Geir say, look, hey, Avraham, and the Shemun Esra? The Gemara says he's a descendant of Avraham. How is he a descendant? Avraham Avinu is the father of all Geirim, which means to say that not only does he attain the element of Kedushas Yisrael, that he attains the element of the sanctity of the Jewish people, but he also is part of the family of the Jewish people because the Torah was machadish, the Torah made the novelty that he could be considered a descendant of Avraham Avinu. Okay, it's a very fundamental concept. Okay, that's Rabbi Naftali Trub, one of the most famous Yisadod 
one of the most famous chidushin novel ideas that come from a Pelotra based on the Ramban in the end of Parshas Emor, and based on the Ritva on Yvamis Daf Menhei, or, or excuse me, on Ksuvis Daf, um, is it Daf Yer Aleph, right? Yeah, Ksuvis Daf Yer Aleph, okay? The sequence then would be, you'd have to first of all become part of Kedusha to say in order to you're saying what happens first? You can't, unless you accept the Yom Mitzvahs, you're not really Mishpachas Yisrael. So Yisrael is asking, at what point is it, does the Ger assume the Kedushas Yisrael, the sanctity? At what point does he assume the Mishpachas Yisrael? At what point does he become part of the extended family of the Jewish people? So this is, according to this is actually one of the discussions in the in the Chreinim. I know that the, the Chreinim some take they take opposite positions exactly when it happened. It very much relates to somebody that was born from a Jewish mother but a non Jewish father. Okay, so we rule that he's fully Jewish. There was an opinion in Tosis in Kedushan Daf Ein Hey that said that he still needs to go for Gior. Okay, we rejected that opinion. If you recall our discussion about artificial insemination. Rabbi Bryce told of Moshe, if a woman is artificially inseminated from the generation of a non-Jew, then according to this Tosas, according to the actually the opinion of the Nesivis, he would have to go through Geiris again. And Bryce said, we have to reckon with this opinion. Moshe said, we don't need to reckon with this opinion. The Chazanish rejected this opinion off the bat. But Rav Tali Trapp came to justify this opinion. He wanted to say that one of the questions on this opinion was the Rabbi Gemara Bukhari said if a Levi has a non-Jewish father and a Jewish mother, he needs Pidyon Haben. So he said it can't be. If he needs to go through Geirus, then how could he have Pidyon Haben? So Rav Maftali Trapp and Nazar Yitzchak and Rav Morozovsky and Rav Haidim came up with this brilliant chaf, as they say. What was the brilliant chaf? He says he has the Mishpach HaSisrael from his mother. The only thing he's missing is the Kedush HaSisrael. So once he gets the Kedusha Yisrael, so retroactively, <coughs> he reverts back to his original status of having Mishpach Yisrael, and that's why he can have, um, that's why he can have Pidim Haben. He says, Father, this is real Achroin Shireid. I don't like to do this in a share of this platform to get into all the Achroin Shireid, all this kind of technical stuff, okay? So that's basically what happens. So basically, so they want to explain that when we were at Sinai, we already had the Mishpach HaSisrael, we just needed the Kedush HaSisrael. So that's why the children were able to be converted. In other words, they already had the Mishpach HaSisrael. They needed to be brought into the Kedush HaSisrael, so we didn't need their consent. Rav Huna's, Rav Huna's Chidosh was that you can take a non-Jew that has neither Kedush HaSisrael, neither Mishpach HaSisrael, you put that child into the mikvah, and as long as he doesn't object when he comes to the age of maturity, he can carry on being a Jew for the rest of his life. That was the Chiddush of Rav Huna. By the way, this is also in number nine in your reference sheet, the Chiddush of Rav Shmuel Rizovsky, and also this is what the Sub of H had said in his Kuntras Hagerim, that that's why you need to have three people when he accepts upon himself the mitzvahs. He says, Mishpat Ksibbe. He says, Mishpat. That's a defining feature of Geirus, the Gemara in Yuvama says. So the Oilam asks that Har Harsinai, where was the Basin? The Gemara says that in order for a Geirus to be valid, it needs to be in the presence of a Basin, which we said, according to most Rishonim, that means that the acceptance of the Mitzvah has to be in the presence of a Basin. Hey, we went through conversion at Sinai. How come there was no Basin over there? Or that maybe the basin Shamala. Okay, maybe that's another answer. Moshe was maybe chashav like a basin. But Rav Shmuel Rozovsky wants to answer it another way. He says, you know why you don't need basin? Since we were only entering into Kedusha Yisrael, when do you need a basin? This answers your question, Rav. That answers your question, uh, Yisachar. The only time that you need a basin is if you're entering both Kedusha Yisrael and Mishpach Yisrael. But since at Sinai was only the Gemar Geirus, it was only getting the Kedusha Yisrael but what he had the Mishpach Yisrael, so therefore, you don't need to have geirus. Therefore, they didn't need to have a basin of three. That's what Rishmur Rizovsky wants to say. Okay. But anyways, according to Rosh Hashiva, I, I heard a lot of this Torah I heard from Rosh Hashiva. As you can see, it's Rosh Rizovsky, Rav Salavechik. You can see that there's a very, very fundamental concept. Number one, the Gemar Nivam is Daf Mem Zayin says you need Kabbalah's all mitzvahs, number one. And according to the, what the Zer Yitzchak quotes, uh, Rav Sender, it's the fundamental act of Geirus. The, and that is the 
element of Geris that needs to be done in the presence of three Dayanim. According to the Shach, it's quoting the Rosh and Taisis, and that's pretty much unanimous in the Rishonim, that if it's not done in the presence of three Dayanim, that he accepts upon himself the Yog of Mitzvahs, there is no Geris. Okay? Again, when we went through Geris at Har Sinai, we said Nasa Vinishma. Everything that needs to be done for Geris is going from Har Sinai. And at Sinai, we said Nasa Vinishma. If we didn't accept upon ourselves the Mitzvahs, there would have been no nationhood at Sinai. The Rebbe Nisad says that our nation is defined by the Torah. Okay? Yeah. 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 So we'll get to the question, what happens if a ger really did accept upon himself the Tariq Mitzvahs, but it was out of coercion? Is it a kosher ger? It must have been the evidence is a kosher ger. So we'll see the rich from the Ramban and Aldo Rishad and we'll explain that concept I hope that goes up pretty soon. Thank you, Hashem. Okay, may all our wishes come true as soon as we ask for them, okay? So now the question is, you need Kabbalah's all mitzvahs. I don't even think Rav Malama denies that. Nobody could deny it because it's an explicit Gemara in the Valmas Daf Mem Zayin. When they ask the girl, yeah. is he capable of saying I'm a Kabbalah all the mitzvahs? Oh, very good. So is he capable of saying I'm a Kabbalah all the mitzvahs? So that's the fundamental question that we get to. What is, we need Kabbalah's mitzvahs. He needs to accept upon himself mitzvahs. Now what is the definition of Kabbalah's all mitzvahs? Does he have to know all 630 mitzvahs? No, because the Gemara Mem Zayn said we inform him of some of the mitzvahs. But we don't inform him about all the mitzvahs. So he doesn't have to actually be cognizant of all 630 mitzvahs and accept them all. So what is the gather of Kabbalah's al mitzvahs? So which takes us to part two of this year, which brings us to Gemara Mechariz Daf Lamed Amid Beis. Says the Gemara Mechariz Daf Lamed Amid Beis, Oyver Kachavim, Shabbat L'Kabbal Divrei Torah, Chutz and Zarechad. A non-Jew says, I'd like to accept the Torah, except for one thing. Shaving with a razor. Shaving with a razor, that's something I won't accept. I need to shave with a razor. And Makab Moisei, then he's not accepted. But the Yisrael Yudah, I'm Rafi, the Diktuk Echad, the Diver Seferim, but the Yisrael goes even further, even if he refuses to conform with a certain rabbinic enactment. Okay? He says, I want to eat chametz until noon on Erev Pesach. He derives, so you only have to stop eating chametz at noon. I'd like to continue eating chametz until noon. Okay? We won't accept him. He says, Rashi, Perish Rashi, Diktuk Echad, Chumid Rabbanim, even this is a rabbinic stringency. And he refuses, in principle, to accept it. We don't accept him as a ger. That's the psak of the Rambam in the Chazis Rebbeir Perik Yudal Halacha Ches. Bizman as a fidu tibul of kol terakula. He's accepting everything. Chutz midiyu kechod ein makab moisei. The Rambam clearly rules like Rabbi Yisroel Rabbi Yehuda that even if he refuses to accept a certain rabbinic stringency, we don't accept him as a ger. Now the question is, what does that mean? Does that mean that we refuse to accept him? Does that mean that Bidyevet, if he was accepted, his garris would be possible, his garris would be invalid? Here's the question. In other words, obviously, we won't agree to accept a ger that says, I'll accept everything except for A, or except for B. But what if we were Megayer him? Is his garris invalid or not? Important question. So the base Yitzchak, the Gevitzinia, our 150 years ago, very important Polisek, he asks this question, and he brings a, a brilliant proof from the Gemara of Vaidizar of Samachdalad on the base. Let's have a look at the Gemara of Vaidizar of Samachdalad on the base. Now, you see in the reference sheet. A is a ger toishiv. Now, as you know, there are two types of ger. Right? One is it called a ger tzedek, a ger that has the full status of a Jew. But there's a ger toishiv. A ger toishiv means to say that he lives in the land of Eretz Yisrael. He doesn't engage in idol worship. He observes the Sheva Nisus B'nai Noyach. He's allowed to live in the land, and not only that, we have a mitzvah to support him, to take care of his welfare, etc., etc. So the Gemara of Oedesert of Samachdal discusses Eze Ger Toishev. Right? What does one need to observe in order to have the status of a Ger Toishev? So the Gemara brings three opinions. The first opinion is Rabbi Meir. The Meir says it's enough for him to accept upon himself that he won't worship idols. That's enough. The second opinion is the Chachamim. The Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, that's the Halacha. The, sech, the seven Noachite laws. Okay? Not to steal, not to murder, not to curse God, not to eat Eber Menachai, etc., etc., to believe in Hashem. Okay. 
the Shavim is his Bnei Noach, which reminds me, I remember I was on a plane, I don't know who I was flying to, and I had my Gemara, my uh, whatever that I was learning, the Gemara, and there was a friendly Canadian non-Jew next to me. He said he moved to Norway, I think. So we got chatting a little bit. She said, can you tell me about what you're learning? It looks interesting. All these small hieroglyphic letters. So he said, I said, this is the Talmud. She says, tell me what the Talmud says. So I told him the Sheva Mitzvah B'nei Nech, the Sheva Nochait Laz. So he was a really good guy. I mean, he was, I talked to him and he, he was very pro-Israel. He, he expressed a lot of liking for Jews and he seemed like a very upstanding person. So I told him the Sheva Mitzvah B'nei Nech and I was thinking that's pretty easy for somebody that seems to be quite an upstanding person. It's probably a a piece of cake for him to keep these seven Ochaid laws. And I remember he had a smile on his face, and I can see this shining, his pride, you can see he said this very proudly. And I said, you know, I keep four out of the seven. <laughs> <laughs> right? Which means to say, I'm assuming he doesn't kill, which maybe means he maybe he doesn't, he, maybe he commits sexual transgressions, maybe he steals, and maybe he doesn't follow the law of the land. Of, and those were out of process of illumination. I assume that those were the three things, right? Yeah, but I assume that he probably is not a murderer. He probably doesn't curse God. Okay. But anyways, he was very proud of himself. He said he got four. That's that's the, that's the majority, right? So, anyways. Okay, so according to Gemara, Avod Hazar Dav Samach Dalid, the Gemara says that if somebody wants to be Gertajah, which means that he'll live in Eretz Yisrael, we'll help him out, we'll make sure he's taken care of. He has to accept upon himself the seven mitzvahs, the seven Ochait laws. The third opinion, according to whom we don't rule, what is a Gertajah? No, this is an opinion that says that a Gertajah actually keeps all the mitzvahs in the Torah except for eating non kosher food. Okay, we don't rule that way, but there is an opinion that holds that a Gertajah would... Exactly. Why specifically not kosher food? I'm sure there's, I'm sure they discussed this. Maybe they wouldn't want to eat. You know, I asked somebody that became observant. I said, what's well, a very difficult mitzvah for you to, for you to keep? She says, basar v'chalav, no one can eat. So people want to eat, people are hungry. It's very restrictive to not be able to eat what you want when you're hungry or when you have a craving for something. There's something about, I guess, food consumption that people find difficult to observe. Okay, so Taisus points out that there's three opinions, Rabbi Meir, Chachamim, and the last opinion is Acherim. Acherim is not Rabbi Meir because Rabbi Meir is the first opinion, okay? So says the Beis Yitzchak, I don't understand. According to the opinion that a Ger Taisha keeps all the mitzvahs, why is he not a Ger Tzedek? He's observing all the mitzvahs. Why is he not considered a fully fledged Jew? So says the Beis Yitzhak, like this is a proof that if somebody refuses in principle to accept even one thing, which is the Ger says, I'll accept everything, but fo fo kosher food consumption I cannot accept. Mm -hmm. You see, he doesn't have the status of a Ger Tzedek. He's not considered a Jew. He has the mere status of a Ger Tosha. So you see that if somebody refuses to accept even one mitzvah, it's not just that we will not accept him as a ger, it means to say that if he does go through such a conversion, he won't be Jewish. It's going to be completely invalid. Do we follow the proof? It's a very clever proof. That's the proof of the base Yitzvah. Yeah. In other words, here's a fellow who says, I'm going to keep everything except for Nevelis and Travis. He doesn't have the status of a Jew. So when the Gemara in Bukhari stopped Lam, it said, according to the Rabbanon, How do you explain it that he says, I don't want to keep the Chumrah of the... Ah, so you didn't want to say there's a difference, Rabbanon, but you see that the Gemara equated a Chumrah the Rabbanon with a Mitzvah the Raisa. And the reason why the Rishadim says is because every Rabbanon has a Raisa element, Laisasa. The Torah says, Laisasa, the Torah says, don't veer from the commands of the Chachamim. Okay? So, so that's basically to reinforce the principle on the Gemara and Bukhar Sadaf Lamed that said if somebody says I'm going to keep everything except for one mitzvah, even if it's only rabbinic stringency, he's not even Jewish. According to the Achairim, according to one opinion, the, the Gemara of Vodah Zadav Samachdal, he would only have the status of a ger, a tosha, but he would not have the status of a Jew. He would not be considered a, a ger. Okay? 
which leads us to a difficulty, and many people have raised this difficulty. This leads us to the Gemara in Shabbos Daf Lamed Aleph, a famous story. The Gemara being stories about Hillel Hazakin, Hillel the Elder, and how he was so easygoing, and how his easygoingness brought three non-Jews to become Jewish. Okay, so the Gemara there retells the Tanur Bana Maisa Benachar Echad Shabbal Pnei Shamai. First, the non-Jew came in front of Shami, who was much more strict. How many Torahs do you have? How many bodies of teachings do you have? So in Malish time we have two. We have Torah Shabbat where we have the written Torah and we have the oral Torah. So in Malish, so the Ger said, I believe you that the written Torah was given by the Divine. I don't believe that your oral Torah was given from the Divine. So Shammai, who was very strict, what did he do? He chased him out. Okay? He came in front of Hillel. So he said, fine, no problem. You wanna, you believe in the written Torah? Hop on board. So what happened? The Gemara says, he taught him the Aleph base. First of all, I find this amazing that Hillel, the leading sage in Israel, is teaching a Ger Aleph base. Today, today, a big rub would consider it beneath his dignity to sit down with the Kanan and say, Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalit. But for Hillel, it wasn't beneath his dignity to sit and teach him the Aleph base. Okay, so the next day he reversed the order of the Aleph base. So on Malaysia, the Ger says, I don't understand you. Yesterday you told me that the order of the Aleph base is this, and now you change. So how do you know that I was correct yesterday? Clearly you have to trust me. Clearly you have to accept the idea that I have an oral tradition. You have to accept that ever, whatever I'm telling you is part of my oral tradition, believe me that it is. Because if you don't believe me that it is, you won't even be able to, you will not be able to believe me as to the correct order of the Aleph base. And then he became Jewish. And the Gemara at the end says that the easygoingness, that the piety of Hillel brought us under the wing of Judaism. Okay, there's another two stories of Gerim that had other hang-ups about becoming Jewish. And then Shammai also chased them out. We'll get to them later. So this leads to the basic question. How do we reconcile this Gemara with the Gemara in Bukhar's Daf Yud Aleph? The Gemara in Bukhar's, excuse me, Bukhar's Daf Lamed. The Gemara in Bukhar's Daf Lamed said, some of this is all become Jewish, except for not eating chametz before chatzais. So not Jewish. Based on the proof from the Gemara in Daf Samach Dalit, he, at best, according to one opinion, has the opinion, he has the status of a Ger Taisha, that he's not Jewish. And here Hillel made somebody Jewish, uh, whilst he was refusing to accept the entire body of the oral Torah? Very basic question. So Rashi is bothered by the question. Okay, Rashi really raises the difficulty. So Rashi first says the reason why Shammai rejected this Gerah because of the Gemara and Bukhar Staf Lamed, number 21 in your reference sheet. Says Rashi, number 21 in your reference sheet, Hill relied on his wisdom. In the end, he's going to accept the entire Torah. Hill saw a certain sincerity with this non-Jew, and Hill understood by his intuition that this fellow was going to accept the entire Torah. He wasn't denying the Torah Shabbat Peh. He just didn't believe that it was from the Divine. Rashi is identifying a very important nuance. And if you misunderstand this nuance, you're going to be misled to think you don't need Kabbalah's own mitzvahs. And a lot of people have been misled by this. In other words, they've taken this nuance point, misunderstood it, and completely ne neglected the Gemara in his own staff and Zion. Rashi is saying he wasn't denying it. He just didn't believe that it was given by the divine. So what does that help? What does it mean he didn't believe that it was given from the divine? So I want to expand on this nuance. Number 22 in your reverend sheet, the Rambam, and it was Shuvah Paragraph Alachaches. What does the Rambam say? The Rambam lists the definition of a min, a heretic. What's the de definition of a min? The Eilu, Sheinam, Chelekim, Haba, Shalai, Shekai, from Batayra. You have three categories of people that deny the Torah. The bottom line of the Rambam that I put in bold one of the definitions of a heretic is somebody that denies the authenticity or the trustworthyhood. No, it's not a word. It's the, 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 the trustworthiness. I think that's the word. Correct me if I made up a word. Right? A person doesn't consider the, the, the body of sages that pass on the Torah to be trustworthy. He said they're not believed to 
pass over the tradition, the Masada that we received at Sinai. Okay? So, that's a very basic concept. Most people are familiar with this. But if somebody den denies that the Chacham, that the sages, are, could be trusted to pass over the Masada, the heritage of the Torah, then he's, a, he's basically a heretic. He's not considered an observant Jew. He's considered a, he's at best uh, an apostate. Okay? So number 23 in the reference sheet, the Gemara in Sanhedrin Sadi Tess, we talked about this Gemara, Rebbe Hillel. Now this is not to be confused with Hillel Hazatim, this is Rebbe Hillel. He lived much later, he lived at the end of the Amoraic period. I'm not sure if this is the Rebbe Hillel that enacted the calendar that we use to, till today. Ein l'mashiach l'isol, there's no Messiah for the Jewish people. Shekvar achlu b'mechizkel, the reward was already eaten up at the times of Chizkel Melech. Amar Yosef Shalim Mar Rebbe Hillel, God should forgive Rebbe Hillel, who denied that there's a Mashiach. Okay, so one of the Amorim, one of the sages of the Talmud, said there's no such thing as Mashiach. Says the Ran, he wasn't denying the future redemption. He wasn't denying the future redemption. The Navi, look at the Navi. It's, the Navi is filled with future prophecies of the redemption. So he couldn't deny it. He was just saying that there was no human. Now look at the bold section number 24 in your reference sheet. Says the Ran, Rabbi Hilam, the We don't need a human king to go to war against the nations and conquer them. That's what he denied. He says, God will do everything. Okay? So the question is, is a person allowed to say that I conform with the opinion of Rabbi Hill? I don't believe there's going to be a human messiah that's going to go to war with the nations and conquer them, defeat the enemies of the Jewish people. So the Chassam Sofer, and absolutely not. Nobody has the right to say that he holds like Rabbi Hill, because after Rabbi Hill came along, the consensus of the sages were to reject the opinion of Rabbi Hillel, which means to say when Rabbi Hillel made his opinion known, there wasn't yet a consensus amongst the sages. But once, the, once there was a consensus amongst the sages that there is a human king that's going to conquer and defeat the enemies of the Jewish people, then nobody could deny the consensus of the sages of Israel. So there will be. The Shut Haridvaz says the same thing, right? Hillel, Adam Gadol, Hillel was a very great man. Vita, but yet he made a mistake. He made a mistake relating to one of the foundations of the Jewish religion. But why was he not a min? If he was denying one of the fundamental yesodas, one of the Yud Gimel Animamins, one of the 13 what we call principles of faith, the Rabbim says you have to believe in the Mashiach. He was denying one of the fundamental Yud Gimel Animamins. Uh, why was he not a, a, a min? So what does the Shutter say? He really believed that he was saying the truth. Yeah, there's a, a saying from Rav Chaim Salavechik. Rav Chaim Rizka, they say, Nebuch an is, is alchad an apikaris. Somebody that is Nebuch, unfortunately, an apikaris, he's still an apikaris. The Radvaz seems to disagree. I would like, I don't think Rav Chaim is correct. The Radvaz says that even if somebody makes a mistake that relates to one of the fundamental concepts of Judaism, but if it's an innocent mistake, he really believes that that's the truth, which means to say, in principle, he says, I accept the entire Torah. But he makes a mistake and he thinks that a certain part of the Torah isn't part of the Torah. That doesn't make him a min. He's not a heretic. The Sefer Ikrim, that's one of the Rishonim, Rav Yosef Alba, number 27 in your reference sheet. I'm just going to, it's a very important paragraph, but let's just read the bold section. He doesn't believe that he's contradicting any of the fundamental tenets of Judaism. He doesn't believe that he's denying something that he's obligated to believe according to the law of the Torah. Ain't a kofer, so he doesn't have the status of a kofer. So Rabbi Hillel thought that he's not obligated to believe that there's a human Mashiach. We are obligated to believe there's a human Mashiach because of the consensus of the sages came along after Rabbi Hillel and says that there is a human Mashiach, but he didn't know that he had to believe that there's a, that there's a human Mashiach. So what I understand like this, this fellow, this is what Rashi is really saying about this ger that Hillel came along and was Megayer. Let's read the words of Rashi again. He didn't deny the Torah Shabbat. He didn't say, I reject a certain part of the Torah. He didn't really believe that that's from the divine. In other words, he said, I'm accepting all the mitzvahs that come from the divine. Unfortunately, he didn't realize that the body of the altar also came from the divine. But he was still willing to accept everything that came from the divine. But if somebody says, I believe that shaving with a razor 
comes from the divine. I believe it's part of your Torah, but I'm not willing to, to, uh, to abide by that belief. I'm not, I'm not ready to subject myself to subject myself to that prohibition. So which means to say, he's not fulfilling the dictum of Nasev and Ishma. What, is, what, did we, what made us Jewish at Sinai? Or gave us the Kedush Yisrael? We said, Nasev, we're going to do whatever God commands, whatever comes from the divine. Nishma, we're going to hear it. Nasev, we're going, Nasev and Nishma, we're going to do it. And then we'll understand. So which means to say that the declaration of a Ger to make in Jews has to be Nasev, Vinishma, whatever I understand to be from the divine, I'm going to do it. If he thinks that shaving from a razor, is, he doesn't yet understand that shaving with a razor comes from the divine, and then later he'll understand that, yes, shaving with a razor is something that's prohibited from the divine, he still accepted upon himself the mitzvahs. It's a very important nuance. If you miss this nuance, you miss everything. It's a nuance, but it's very fundamental. I hope you follow me, which means to say like this. You have two non-Jews, okay? We'll call them Reuben and Shin. Okay? Reuben and Simon. Okay? I just like to use Reuben and Shin. Yeah, Reuben. Okay. Okay. Two non Jews, Reuben and Shin. Right? Reuben says, I'm going to accept everything that comes from the divine. Nasav and Ishma. Whatever the Jewish people are obligated to believe in, whatever the Jewish people are obligated to perform, whatever they're obligated to abide by, I'm fully committed to that. But I don't believe that uh, the oral Torah was given from the divine. The Kutim, very good. So I have an entire section of the Kutim. Obviously, we're not going to get to this in year. We're going to get to the next year. We're going to have a long discussion about the Kutim. This is going to take two or three shirim to get to this whole thing of Geirut. So Ruvain, if he becomes Jewish, but the Ebed will, he, he, his, his conversion is kosher. Shimon says, I believe everything is from the divine, but I'm just not willing to accept a certain element of what the divine commanded. So he's not Jewish. He has to conform with what we did when we were at Sinai. Nasa Venishma, whatever I recognize to be from the divine, I'm completely committed to it. Okay, so that's the fundamental point that has to be understood correctly. Otherwise, people could think, that you can become Jewish without accepting mitzvahs. A lot of people base themselves, a lot of rabbis base themselves on this Gemara in uh, part of it. Part of it. But again, we'll discuss what Rav Malamud really. We're going to get to, we have to finish the Shia. We didn't even get to half the Shia. But Rav Chaim Moser talks about somebody that says, I'm committed to accept everything in Judaism, but I know that my Yetzirah, my evil inclination, will get the better of me, and I know that there's no way that I will be able to resist that temptation. But the evidence is also kosher gerus. Exactly, it's a kosher gerus. Which means to say, a person says, I am doing this, and I am acknowledging that I will be obligated to do everything. I will be obligated to eat kosher. I will be obligated not to drive on Shabbos. I will be obligated in everything. But I know fully well that despite my acknowledgement that I have to do X, Y, Z, and I have to do everything in the Torah, I know that my Yetzirah will get the better of me. I know that I will not have the self-control to live the way I believe I should live. That's also kosher gerus, says Rav Chaim Ozer Again, he was misunderstood. Rav Chaim Ozer said, he's makabal kol ha so they threw out the first half of the sentence of Chaim Moezer Gordansky said. They threw out the fact of Chaim of Kol HaMitzvahs and they took the second half of the statement which said So which means to say if somebody comes from Russia, from the Soviet Union and he wants to uh, have access, he wants to gain entry into Eretz Yisrael, he wants to be allowed to establish residency here. And he says, yeah, I, I'm... I'm, I'm becoming Jewish. What are you going to do? I'll live as a Mesorti Jew. I'll live as a traditional Jew. What does that mean? I'll light candles on Hanukkah. I'm going to eat matzah on Pesach. What, what else? So he says, are you going to, are you going to drive on Shabbos? Yeah, I'm going to drive on Shabbos. Why are you going to drive on Shabbos? So if the reason is because he says, I know my Yitzhak will get the better of me, but I know fully well and I'm accepting upon myself and I'm acknowledging that, I, that I'm not allowed to drive on Shabbos, then the evidence of the will be kosher. But if he says driving on Shabbos, I don't think you need to accept that to become Jewish. There are many good Jews that drive on Shabbos. He doesn't think that he needs to accept it. He says, is it part of the Jewish religion? Yeah, I know it's part of the Jewish religion, but I don't need to accept it to become Jewish. Then his gerus is not valid. 
Okay, so we'll continue and expand on this. We're like in the middle of something, right? We're left in the middle. Uh, the, the, the whole concept has been only partially explained, but we'll have to continue this in next week. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Okay.